Magandang araw, class. So, um, move forward na tayo sa chapter 6 uh, module natin. Um, our topic will be general toxicology. So, what is toxicology? This is the study of the nature, effects, and detection of poisons, and the treatment of poisoning. It is a scientific study of poisons that treat their nature, properties, effects, and detection, and the treatment in cases of poisoning. It also includes the study of the adverse effects of chemicals, the physical and, adverse, the physical and biological agents on living organisms. So, toxicity is the ability of a substance to cause injury to a biologic material. For example, a uh, human being, we are biologic materials as well as uh, the animals around us. So, um, tinitreat natin yung, sa study ng toxicology, tinitreat natin yung effects sa human being or sa animals ng mga uh, poisonous substances uh, and the dosage na pwedeng gamitin just in case na pwedeng gamitin sa medicine yung isang toxin. So, what is the importance of toxicology? Bakit ba natin kailangan pag-aralan to, lalong-lalo na sa forensic chemistry? This is to verify if it is a case of poisoning, to be able to treat as the occasion demands, and to forward justice. So, meron kasing mga nangyayaring incidents of um, unexplained death na akala ay um, simpleng cardiac arrest or yung mga usual na natural causes of death. But unknowingly, nalalaman lang minsan na meron palang cases of poisoning or toxicology case kapag ka nag-undergo ng autopsy yung isang cadaver. So, minsan kasi kadalasan, lalo na sa mga far-flanked areas, they, yung family ng victims, they chose not to undergo autopsy. So, simple post-mortem examination lang ng cadaver, okay na sa kanila para sa um, death certificate ng kamag-anak nila. But that is not always the case. Lalong-lalo na kung na-hospital, unexplained, wala namang sakit talaga yung tao, or healthy naman siya, na lagi naman nagpapacheck up, and then biglaan, namatay siya. Tapos, uh, kapag ka nakita ng doktor na merong unexplained um, mga batches sa skin niya, mga ganun, pwede mag-undergo ng autopsy para mag-dig deeper kung ano ba talaga yung naging cause of death. So, isa yan sa importance ng toxicology. Pinag-aaralan kung meron bang involved na toxin or poison na nakapag-cause ng death ng isang tao. So, ang history of modern toxicology, it is um, way back in the 16th century pa. When a German Swiss or a physician or alchemist, para Paracelsus, is considered to be the father of modern toxicology. Bakit siya nag-consider na father of modern toxicology? He first stressed the chemical nature of poison and its action by experimentation. So usually kasi, lalo na sa science, nalalaman yung action ng isang chemical agent, reagent, or um, a poison or toxin, um, nalalaman yung effects nila during the conduct of experimentation. He also introduced the dose concept wherein he quoted that all substances known to humans are poisons and only the dose determines the effect. So, um, yun, siya yung nag-quote niya na um, lahat halos ng um, nasa paligid natin na iniintroduce natin sa katawan natin ay po, considered poisonous. Ang nagde-determine lang ng... Um, Positive effect and adverse effect sa katawan natin is yung dosage. So, kapag na-overdose tayo, maaaring hindi maging maganda yung effect sa katawan natin. But, kung, hindi naman, kung tama naman yung dosage na gagamitin natin, pwede siyang makagaling sa kung ano man yung sakit natin. Okay, so meron nga kasabihan na too much of something is bad enough. Parang ganun yung... Pero meron din naman na... Um, minsan, sa isa poison, kapag too much, minsan nakakatulong din kasi nadedetect siya agad ng katawan, naiinduce yung vomiting. 
And then kapag so, uh, merong mga different kinds of poison din naman na mas poisonous siya kapag inintroduce little by little sa katawan just like arsenic. So later on, uh, madidiscuss natin yung tungkol dyan. So we have uh, specialized fields in toxicology. Meron tayong tinatawag na descriptive to toxicology. It involves the toxicity testing of chemicals. Providing information for safety evaluation and regulatory requirements. For example, before i-introduce yung isang product, uh, ina-examine muna, muna yung um, ano ba yung, for example, ilan ba yung protein content niya, ilan ba yung calcium content. Just like my experience in uh, sweet foods nung nagtatrabaho pa ako before sa PNP, Ah, uh, isa sa part ng job description ko is to determine kung gaano karami yung um, percentage ng protein sa feeds, animal feeds or usually sa poultry. So, ah, uh, dinedetermine namin, ah, uh, yan din yung makikita nyo sa for example sa mga kinakain natin sa na kapag tiningnan natin yung packaging sa likod, nakalagay diyan yung mga nutrition facts. So, makikita natin doon gano'n ba karami yung protein dito, carbohydrates, saturate, saturated fat. Yun yung isang example ng descriptive toxicology. So, ine-evaluate niya kung pasado ba siya sa regulatory requirements at pwedeng introduce sa human being. Then, we have mechanistic toxicology. This is concerned with identifying and understanding mechanisms by which the chemicals exert toxic effects on living organisms. So, dito naman um, pinag-aaralan yung mechanism ng toxin sa katawan ng tao. That's why uh, from the word itself, uh, it is mechanistic because of the mechanism. And then we have the regulatory toxicology which involves decisions based on data provided by descriptive and mechanistic toxicology, whether a chemical poses a sufficiency, low risk, capability for consumers for the stated purposes. So, dito naman sa regulatory committee, parang sila yung nagre-regulate ng if okay ba yung um, dosage na yon na i-consume ng tao. Based naman, ang basis nitong pagre-regulate is yung studies done by the descriptive toxicology and by the mechanistic to toxicology. Okay? So, we have other specialized fields. Also, we have uh, what we are discussing uh, for this subject is the forensic toxicology. It is concerned primarily with the medical-legal aspects of the harmful effects of chemicals on human and animals. Then, we also have um, clinical toxicology. It is concerned with the diseases caused by or uniquely associated with toxic, toxic substances. So, yung forensic toxicology, pinag-aaralin usually sa mga forensic sciences, just like in your subject and in the PNP. Um, clinical toxicology, mostly ang nag-studies niyan ay yung mga physicians sa isang hospital. And then we have also environmental toxicology which focuses on the impacts of the chemical pollutants in the environment and on biological organisms. For example, um, yung mga pesticide residue na nakukuha natin sa mga inaani or ina-harvest natin ng mga uh, vegetables. So, pwede rin niyang aralin under the specialized field of environmental toxicology. And then we have occupational toxicology. This is the study of the adverse effects of agents that may be encountered by workers during the course of their employment. Kasi parang isa yan sa mga nagiging tinatawag natin na occupational hazards. Occupational because it is concerned with the occupation of a person. Just like what I have encountered when I was doing my on-the-job training, I... Um, I was um, training sa isang uh, analytical laboratory services na nagpapa-examine sa kanila yung mga usually parang may routine examination yung mga workers sa isang sa isang corporation 
um, pinapatest routinely yung mga blood samples nila sa AAS or Atomic Absorption Spectroscopy, pinapatest for the presence of lead. Kung sobrang nagiging mataas na yung um, concentration ng lead sa blood nila, that is very um, dangerous na to their health. So, that is an example of occupational toxicology. So, we have risk and exposure. Uh, risk is the potential likelihood that injury or the biological damage will occur in a given situation. So, meron tayong tinatawag na risk assessment. I-assess natin ano ba yung potential uh, or uh, likelihood na magiging danger siya sa isang tao or yung isang exposure ay magiging danger sa atin. And then, exposure is the amount of chemical that is available for absorption. Then, safety, this is the probability that harm will not occur under specified conditions. Or, this is a uh, opposite of risk. So, yung, kung meron tayong risk, this is the danger or likelihood of an injury occurring. While safety naman is the opposite, meaning no harm will, will occur. So, um... Risk natin is equal to the toxicity times exposure. So, kung may toxicity and then multiplied uh, by the exposure, yun yung um, assessment natin ng tinatawag na risk. Uh, this is considering the toxicology or um, poison. Okay? So, speaking of poisons, we have the classification. So, first, we will discuss the classification according to the source or origin. So, we have animal toxin. Uh, Siyempre, galing yan sa animals produced by a living organism, stimulated through the production of antibodies. The toxin is usually transferred through bites and stings of venomous, terrestrial, or marine animals, the examples are poisonous snakes, rabies, scorpions, even ants, the jellyfish, uh, which is um, usually ang na-experience natin sa kanila is yung sting nila, and then stingrays. Those are just examples. But in, the truth is, uh, as a human being tayo, meron na tayo actually presence ng toxin sa katawan natin in very um, minimal amount or yung amount na nagpo may nagpo-produce din kasi ng toxin sa katawan natin which is um, kailangan hindi siya tataas depending on the food that we take. Okay, na and next we have vegetable. These are vegetable poison. These are derived from plants naman. Example, we have poison ivy, jimson weed, plants, mercury chloride, acid poison, use as herbicides. Ito naman, yung mga sinasabi natin kanina, katulad sa um, yung mga nag-spray ng pesticide kasi, pag nag-spray kasi ng pesticide sa isang farm, nagkakaroon tayo ng risk sa exposure sa pesticide residue. And then, kapag hinarvest yun, syempre, hindi naman agad-agad nawawala yung pesticides dun sa mga vegetables na kinakain natin. So, meron na rin mga na nagaganap or ginagawang studies sa pesticide residue at saka yung effect nun sa um, sa katawan ng tao. And then, we have minerals. These are derived from mineral deposits like hydrochloric acid, caustics, caustic alkali. So, ito naman yung sa mga minahan na kukuha. Kaya, minsan, nagkakaroon ng sakit yung mga nasa minahan or nasa lugar kung saan malapit, may malapit na minahan kasi nagkakaroon ng poisoning hindi lang sa air, kundi pati sa groundwater na naabsorb ng lupa and then pwede ring maabsorb ng mga tinatanim dun sa mga lupa na yun and then hanggang umaabot hanggang sa groundwater. And then, pati sa supplies ng water na iniinom ng mga tao, ginagamit sa pagtututbrush, nagkakaroon na na rin ng traces ng poison. Then, we have microbial. These are produced or made up of microscopic organisms. Like, for example, the bacteria, fungi. Then, we have synthetic. These are synthesized by chemists in the laboratories. 
and plants, yung mga chemical plants, hindi yung plants na mga halaman, okay? Examples are drugs, pesticides, as well as chemicals purified from natural sources, such as metals from ores, and solvents from gasoline. So, usually, yung mga ginagamit kasi natin sa pang-araw-araw na buhay natin, actually, um, may risk tayo dyan of poisoning. So, we have to be really careful. Like, for example, magpapagas lang tayo ng sasakyan. Uh, usually, di ba, na i-inhale natin yung solvents. Uh, solvents are um, yung mga agad-agad na nag-vaporize or nag-evaporate. Uh, usually, na amoy, na amoy naman yung solvent sa gasolina. So, isa yun sa mga synthetic na poisons na na-encounter natin almost every day. Pati yung mga, like for example, like yung sinabi ko kanina, yung mga pesticide residue sa mga kinakain nating gulay, pwede rin yung makaharm sa ating katawan. So, everyday na kumakain tayo, na naglalakad uh, tayo, nagtatransport tayo, pwede tayong, or we are really actually exposed to poisons. So, an example of animal toxin is um, from the puffer fish. So, this is the picture of a puffer fish. Okay? So, ang ibang um, names ng puffer fish ay blowfish, swellfish, globefish, puffers, or fugu. Actually, may mga nag-aalaga nito sa aquarium. Uh, yung mga mahilig lang mag-aalaga ng mga, toxi eh, mga exotic din na fishes. So, okay, I'm back. I'm sorry for the interruption. Um, let's go back to animal toxin uh, regarding puffer fish. So, ito ulit yung itsura ng mga puffer fish. Uh, they are also called blowfish, swellfish, globefish, puffers, or fugu. Actually, these are the types of fish na ang isa sa defense mechanism nila is kapag ka may lumalapit na kalaban or mga predators, nagpa-puff sila from, from this figure. For example, this is the puffer fish available. Ah, uh, yan yung normal size nila. And then kapag ka uh, as a defense mechanism, pag meron predator sa kapaligiran or may mag a sa kanila, magsuswell sila na parang bola. So, ganyan, lalaki sila with um yung, yung parang may mga kaliskis nila dito. Yan. Kasi yun yung mata nila. Kaya sila tinawag na puffer fish kasi parang nagiging uh, puffy ball sila as their defense mechanism. Okay? So, that's why they are also called um, blowfish, swellfish, kasi yun yung nangyayari sa kanila. And then, these poisonous marine fish are from the family Tetraodontidae, which means four-toothed fish. They are, there are about 120 species of puffers, their habitat varies, but generally, they are found in the warm, shallow, tropical to subtropical waters of the West Indies, like Japan, China, and even in, here in the Philippines, in Mexico, and Taiwan. In Southern Asia and the Philippines, they can be found on rivers and mangroves. In Japan, there is a culture there. Um, they are considered a delicacy to eat, costing up to $200 in restaurants. The fish's skin, liver, gonads, and muscles contain a toxin called tetrodoxin or TTX. This toxin is heat-stable, so cooking or freezing doesn't reduce potency. So kahit iluto siya, hindi nawawala yung toxicity dun sa mga fish, sa fish na yun. But, merong mga specially trained chefs sa Japan na sila lang yung allowed na mag-prepare at magluto ng mga puffer fish or sushi. Sushi ang ginagawa nila, okay? So, para maiwasan yung uh, sobrang toxicity ng mga fish na yan. But, there are still about 200 cases of poisonings per year 
with half resulting in death. So, kahit na ganun, alam naman kasi nung mga nag-order ng puffer fish, for example, dun sa mga restaurant sa Japan, na toxic yung puffer fish. But, isa yun sa culture na kapag kumain ka, parang nakakadagdag sa pagiging macho, sa pagiging sikat. Yun yung reasons bakit kumakain pa rin sila nun, kahit na very toxic yung fish na yun. So, this is the toxin cycle, if you can see. The tetrodoxin uh, toxin is found in, is an alkaloid or a phytochemical called the alkaloid. They are found in dinoflagellates like this. Like this. Uh, which are marine planktons or whirly whips that proliferate in nutrient-loaded red tide waters. So, kapag may red tide, may mga dinoflagellates like this na pinaninirahan ng mga alkaloids na tetrodoxin. And then, the true origin of TTX or tetrodoxin is thought to be bacterial derived from vibrinose or pseudonoma species ng mga dinoflagellates. And then, um, itong dinoflagellates na to na sa red tide waters, kinakain naman ng mga crustaceans, mga mollusks, sponges, katulad ni Spongebob, and mga sea yeah. urchins. Kinakain nila itong mga dinoflagellates na yan. And then, these crustaceans and mollusks, or others who have, which have eaten the dinoflagellates, will be eaten by a puffer fish. So, ito yung sinasabi ko kanina na defense mechanism nila. Ito na yung itsura nila para silang bloated. And then, may mga spikes dyan para panlaban nila dun sa mga um, predators. And then, ito ang puffer fish na to, kinoconsume naman ng mga humans. So, yung puffer fish, kapag kinain nila yung or kinonsume nila itong mga crustaceans and mollusks na to na nakapag-consume ng dinoflagellates containing the tetrodoxin, hindi sila affected. Kasi, meron sa katawan nila na tinatawag na single point mutation in their sodium channel receptors. So, meron silang panlaban dun sa toxin. Which is, tayo as human beings ay walang panlaban sa toxin na yan. So, kapag kinonsume at hindi tama yung pagkaluto at hindi kaya ng uh, limit ng katawan, pwedeng ikamatay, magkasakit, and then later on, pwedeng mag-result sa death. So, the physiological symptoms of um, the tetrodoxin in our body may vary. So, pwedeng iba-iba yan. But generally, ang may experience ng mga taong affected ng toxin, merong tingling and burning of the mouth and tongue 20 minutes to 3 hours after consumption, headache, sensations of lightness or floating, nausea, impaired coordination, increasing paralysis, slurred speech, Hypotension. So, this is different from hypertension. So, di, ito yung opposite ng hypertension, yung hypotension. So, kung yung hypertension is uh, high blood pressure, yung hypotension naman is a condition of low blood pressure. And then, pwedeng magkaroon ng cardiac arrhythmia, convulsions, and death within 4 to 6 hours. Okay, so, very potent yung toxin ng, na tetrodoxin kapag na-consume galing sa mga puffer fish. So, kung titingnan nyo, parang animal lang siya na nakikita sa mga estuaries, but then, yun pala, very dangerous sa atin. But then, meron tayong mga tinatawag na facts and benefits ng toxin na yan. Katulad ng sinabi ko kanina, meron, meron din um, inborn toxin sa katawan ng mga tao. And then, may toxin din na ginagamit sa me medicine para pang gamot ng mga certain illnesses. But this toxin has no antidote. So, kapag ka, um, nagkakonsume ka ng toxin na yan, walang antidote. And then, ito ngayon katulad sinabi ko kanina, meron lang certified chefs in Japan na ka, who can properly prepare and cook the puffer fish. And then, yung farmed fugu or the 
na uh, or puffer fish are non-toxic kasi farmed sila. So, yung mga puffer fish kasi nag nahuhuli sa mga ilog lang, sa mga estuaries, sa river, sa mangroves, or where, where, wherever, hindi, um, sila yung nakakakonsume ng mga dinoflagellates na nasa red tide waters. While well, yung farmed fugu, alam nung farmer kung saan sila nanggaling, kung ano yung pinapakain sa kanila right from the very start. So, they are non-toxic. Kasi hindi naman nila na-consume yung uh, toxin from the dinoflagellates. And then, um, fugu rub ripes or tiger puffer fish are used to help map human genome. So, ito yung mapping ng human genome. Uh, pwedeng malaman dun kung uh, meron ka bang history ng, sa family mo ng pagkakasakit ng cancer or... Meron bang possibility na magkaroon ka ng cancer or whatever disease? These toxins are also used in modern medicine as supplement for recovering heroin addicts, painkiller for victims of neuralgia, arthritis, rheumatism, and cancer, certain cancers. So, ito nga yung sinasabi natin na depende sa dosage to. Depende sa dosage pag hindi tama yung dose na na-introduce na sa katawan mo, pwede ka mamatay. But then, uh, with the right guidance, kaya nga inaaral yan with the descriptive toxicology and uh, later on with the regulatory toxicology, inaaral kung paano yung concentration or dosage ng toxin ang allowable or pwedeng gamitin. And, uh, syempre, in uh, coordination or uh, kung paano sila mag-work kasama yung other um, chemicals or other products. So, it depends on the studies. So, next is the classifications of poisons naman according to the chemical properties. So, tapos na tayo dun sa... Um, source or origin, punta naman tayo sa um, chemical properties. Hindi ko pa yata na-discuss yung mga ibang pinanggagalingan. Okay, so, next is sa uh, chemical properties naman. So, meron tayong volatile poisons. These are poisonous substances which are capable of converting from liquid to gas without the application of heat. So, kapag ka uh, Uh, nasa open air lang siya at pinabayaan mo na walang takip nag evaporate siya mas, mas mabilis siya mag-evaporate so magkakaroon ng conversion from the liquid state to the gaseous state kapag ganun na mabilis mag-evaporate ang tawag doon volatile substances and in case of poisons they are called uh, volatile poisons so these compounds can be isolated using steam distillation and analyzed using GC or uh, GCMS also. So, for example, ang volatile poisons natin in acidic medium are CCL4 or carbon tetrachloride, CHCl3 or chloroform, cyanide, ethanol, methanol, and nitrobenzene. Kung mapapansin nyo itong ethanol, methanol, actually mga alcohols yan na usually ginagamit in fermentation of yung mga beverages natin, of uh, alcoholic beverages. So, kung mapapansin nyo, isa pa lang form ng poison yung mga alcohols na kinoconsume natin. So, it depends on the dose. Usually, kapag na-overdose na tayo or nasobrahan na ng inom, it may lead to death or um, a feelings of pagkakasakit, illnesses, yun And then, in basic medium naman, we have aniline, amphetamine, methadone, and nicotine. Nicotine, which is found in cigarette, cigarette smoke also. So, ito yung process na tinatawag natin na steam distillation. Process of separating and isolating the volatile poisons. So, this is a special type of distillation which is used to separate volatile and temperature-sensitive substances. So, pwedeng gamitin to yung steam as the source of heat. Um, this is the parts of the distillation setup. We have the distilling flask. 
here's the distilling flask, the condenser, then the receiver, the flask, thermometer, water inlet, and then outlet also, and glass tubing. So, at glass tubing ginagamit natin dito. Okay? So, that's an example of a steam distillation setup. Uh, many complex organic compounds tend to decompose at sustained high temperatures. And in these cases, separation by normal distillation is not an option. So, ang ginagamit is water or steam is introduced in the distillation apparatus. Kapag nag-add na ng water or steam, the boiling point of the compounds is depressed or nilolower daw niya yung boiling po points ng compounds para mas matagal yung distillation process. Mag-aalaw siya na mag-evaporate at lower temperatures. Prefer preferably below the temperature at which the deterioration of the material becomes appreciable. So, para hindi mag-deteriorate yung uh, material na kailangan natin, ginagamitan ng mas mababang temperature, kaya nag introduce ng water or steam. If the substances to be distilled are very sensitive to heat, uh, we cannot also use the steam distillation. Uh, I mean, we can use the steam distillation, but we combine it with the vacuum distillation. So, after distillation, the vapors are condensed as usual, usually yielding a two-phase system of water and the organic compounds. So, uh, since yung organic compounds, most of the organic compounds are not miscible in water or not soluble in water, pwede na silang ma-separate um, through simple separation techniques. Then we have uh, gases. These are poisons usually not chemically detectable because as uh, we all know, hindi naman natin talaga nakikita yung mga gases. However, they may be isolated from the blood or the lungs or the lung tissue. The examples of these are carbon monoxide, chlorine, and others. For example, meron kasing nangyayari na carbon monoxide poisoning. Katulad ng kapag nilagay sa enclosed space yung isang tao, sa usually sa car, and then yung tambucho, um, parang inano dun sa loob ng car na yun, ng enclosed space na yun, so pwedeng ma-inhale ng, ng victim. So kapag nangyari yun, magkakaroon siya ng carbon monoxide poisoning which maaari niyang ikamatay. Okay, so na-detect naman yung carbon monoxide poisoning sa pag-examine or pag-analyze ng blood ng victim. Then next is the non-volatile poisons. Most drugs are non-volatile. They can be extracted using acid and basic medium in a suitable solvent. So, it depends kung ano yung nature ng poison natin. Then, we have the anions. Uh, the usual examples are household chemicals. This range of poison are usually inorganic and in nature. So, uh, sa mga ginagamit natin na household chemicals natin, Meron din tayong pwedeng ma-pick up na mga poisonous substances dyan. Lalo na yung hindi nahugasan mabuti yung mga ano natin, mga kinakain or kapag sobrang chemically in induced na yung mga ibang uh, food or yung mga kinoconsume natin. Uh, some uh, other classification includes the metallic poisons. These are usually encountered in places near mining. So, Kasi nga, katulad na sinabi ko kanina, sa isang minahan, pwedeng mag-leak ng metallic poisons through the groundwater or sometimes the air also. So, kapag nag-leak na siya sa groundwater, pwede na siya maka-penetrate sa mga households natin, sa mga, sa mga water system sa household. And then next, we have the miscellaneous po poisons like the pesticides and pesticides residue. Yung pesticides natin, yung mismong pesticide na ina-apply natin dun sa mga pananim natin. And then yung residues it themselves are yung natira or na, um, 
nagpenetrate naman dun sa mismong vegetable na kinakain natin. So, now we have the classification according to physical form or properties. So, it can be solid, liquid, gas, vapor, or aerosol. Katulad mga ginagamit natin na pamatay ng ipis, pamatay ng lamok, they are aerosols. So, meron din mga poisons na pwedeng makuha sa mga ganyan. Kaya dapat mag-ingat tayo sa lalo na kahit yung lysol na ginagamit natin, meron din poisons na pwede tayo makuha. That's why kung gagamit tayo ng mga aerosols, dapat gumamit tayo ng masks and pati mga gloves also. And hindi tayo mag-stay dun sa room na pinag-sprayan natin ng aerosol. Dapat pa, pa, pa walain mo na natin yung bisa um, para lang concentrated siya sa kung ano dapat yung gawin niya. For example, mamatay ng ipis, pamatay ng lamok. Kaya namamatay yung mga lamok sa mga ipis, mga langgam is because of the poison in that aerosol. Which will also be um, will also have a negative effect on our selves. Okay? So, influence, this influences the exposure and absorbability. Solids are not well absorbed into the blood. They must be dissolved in aqueous liquid lining the intestinal tract if ingested or respiratory tract if inhaled. So, the factors in determining the rate of dissolving or dissolution rate, we have the solubility and the size of granules. Kapag soluble yung poison or substance natin, mas mabilis siyang ma-ingest sa, sa katawan ng tao. And then, the size of granules naman, syempre kung mas maliliit, uh, unknowingly na ingest natin yung poison. While kung mas malalaki, Um, pwede pa natin siyang iwasan or hindi makita. Pwede natin siyang makita and then pwede natin siyang ma-remove doon sa kinakain natin, for example. Now, according to physiological action, the classifications of poisons are irritants. By direct contact, the poison inflames the mucous membrane or parts it comes in contact with. So, the result may be nausea, vomiting, pain, and diarrhea. For example, these poisons are bromine, chlorine, and cotton oil. So, it depends also dun sa reaction ng katawan ng tao. Uh, kung may allergy siya dun sa substance na yon, mas mabilis yung pagka-irritate ng katawan niya. Then, corrosives. These are by direct contact. Chemically produces local destruction of tissues. Uh, examples nito yung mga strong acids like nitric acid and then also sulfuric acid phenols, hydrochloric acid and caustic soda usually yung hydrochloric acid nagagamit natin sa paglilinis ng uh, mga CR um, and it is uh, locally produced as muriatic acid yung muriatic acid na yan is mainly hydrochloric acid that's why kung nakagamit na kayo ng muriatic acid, mapapansin nyo na nangangati yung mata nyo, pati yung pag nagkaroon kayo ng direct contact sa skin at hindi kayo gumamit ng gloves, pwede rin magangati yung mga kamay nyo or masunog eventually. Lalo na kung mataas yung concentration ng hydrochloric acid dun sa muriatic acid na ginamit nyo. And then also, mapapansin nyo, kapag na-expose kayo dun sa room, na nilagyan nyo ng muriatic acid and then enclose siya, mahirapan kayong huminga because they are corrosives. Ganon din yung effect ng caustic soda. Although, hydrochloric acid is an acid and caustic soda is a base or sodium hydroxide. But they have, uh, they are both strong. Um, this hydrochloric acid is a strong acid and uh, sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So, yung effect nila, malakas din ang effect sa katawan natin. So, that's why we have to be very careful in handling chemicals, household chemicals. Um, we have to protect ourselves and um, be sure na alam natin yung first aid na gagawin natin just in case na um, maka-experience tayo or matapunan tayo ng mga chemicals na to. Then, next are neurotics. 
These are these affect the central nervous system kaya nga neurotic yung tawag sa kanya. So these are the classifications of neurotics naman. There are cerebral neurotics like the narcotics. So this in induce drowsiness, sleep, stupor, complete or in complete insensibility or loss of feeling. So, for example, the opium, tobacco, alcohol, yan yung examples ng cerebral neurotic. So, ang tinatarget nito is the brain kasi cerebral siya. So, next is yung spinal neurotics naman. Ang tinatarget is yung spine. This act on the spinal cord producing spasmodic or continuous contraction of muscles resulting in the stiffness of the parts to which they are attached. For example, we have the bacterial disease tetanus. So, kapag ka naapektuhan ka ng tetanus, uh, your or yung tinatawag na tetanus toxoid, um, yan yung magiging effect, ang magiging target niya is the spinal column or spinal cord. Then, we have uh, picrotoxin and strychnine. Actually, itong strychnine, Uh, narinig ko siya sa isang napanood ko na series uh, na ginamit siya na pang poison sa isang person. So, ipapakita ko mamaya yung effects ng striking sa, striking sa katawan. Then, we also have the cerebrospinal neurotics naman. Ito, combination of the brain and the spine. Kaya, cerebro from the brain and spinal from the spinal cord. So, we have naman delirians. Uh, brain causing disorder of mental functions results in confusion of free will. So, for example, the marijuana, cannab uh, cannabis indica, cocaine, and belladonna. I also have heard belladonna being mentioned in other movies that I have watched. Then, we have depressants, a substance that depress or retard the physiological actions of the central nervous system like antipyrene and lobelia. Then we have um, aesthetics or exhaustive. These poisons that cause marked loss or of vital or muscular power or general weakness. The examples are aconite, KCN, and digitalis or potassium cyanide. KCN is potassium cyanide. Ah, so, hindi pala pinakita dito yung strike name. I'm sorry. Um, classification of poisons according to their effects on the body or target sites. So, meron na ang target ng poison is yung skin and tissue. Um, ang examples is phenol and hydrochloric acid. Then, ang uh, target naman is yung blood or cold blood poisons, the carbon monoxide hydrogen cyanide. And then, the nervous system, ang target, uh, meron tayong convulsant, like strychnine and brucine. And then, yung somnifacients, which causes sleep and coma, like opium and alcohol. Then, we have cardiac poisons, which targets the cardiovascular system or the heart. It stops the heart, like digitalis and typirine. And then, we have anesthetics, It, in, it produces sleep and insensibility to pain. So, like chloroform and ether. Yan yung mga target sites ng mga poisons uh, depending on their type. <coughs> Excuse me. So, ito na pala yung sinasabi ko, ang example ng strychnine poisoning. So, this is the chemical structure of strychnine. This can be fatal to humans and other animals and can occur by inhalation, swallowing or absorption through the eyes or mouth. It produces some of the most dramatic and painful symptoms, I mean, sorry, dramatic and painful symptoms of any known toxic reaction. It making it quite noticeable and a common choice for assassinations and poison attacks. For this reason, strychnine poisoning is often portrayed in literature and film. 
such as the murder mysteries written by Agatha Christie. So, yun isang example ng application ng strychnine poisoning in the literature. So, katulad nga nang nabanggit ko, I have just recently watched a series na strychnine poisoning din yung ginamit sa prison. Okay? So, the presentation in humans, there is 10 to 20 minutes after exposure. Ito yung nangyayari sa katawan ng napoison ng strychnine. The body muscles begin to spasm. Starting with the head and neck in the form of trismus and rhizus sardonicus. The spasms then spread to every muscle in the body with nearly continuous spread with nearly continuous convulsions and get worse at the slightest stimulus. The convulsions progress, increasing intensity and frequency until the backbone arches continually. Convulsions lead to lactic acidosis, hyperthermia, and rhabdomyolysis. These are followed by postictal depression and then death comes from asphyxiation caused by paralysis of the neural pathways that control breathing or by exhaustion from the convulsions. So, the subject usually dies within 2 to 3 hours after the exposure. So, sure na yung pagkamatay dito sa striking poisoning but ang pagkakasabi meron pa rin nakakasurvive kaya lang siguro yung effect sa katawan nila is very um, dramatic na din. Um, uh, nagkakaroon na ng sobrang fatigue sa katawan ng tao because of sa mga dramatic uh, na nangyari nga dito sa pagka-poison nila with strychnine. So, we also have the types of poison action in the body. We have the systematic poisons or local this acts on the, on the specific target organ. For example, yung nervous system, which is usually, yun naman talaga yung ina-attack kadalasan ng mga poisons. And then we have the general, it acts on every part it attaches. So yung systematic, meron lang siyang target na organ. Kasi systematic siya. And then yung general, it depends kung saan ma-attach yung poison kapag na-ingest sa katawan. And then we have cumulative, this one that increases suddenly in its intensity of action after gradual additions. That's why it is cumulative, um, nagkakaroon ng first exposure and then uh, nagkakaroon ng gradual addition. So usually, ganito yung nangyayari sa arsenic poisoning. Kasi kapag large amount ng arsenic yung na-ingest ng katawan, um, madedetect yan ng mga... Um, ano sa katawan natin and then magkakaroon tayo ng action na ibabamit yung arsenic. So, ang ginagawa kapag ka, ng mga gustong magpoison poison us using arsenic poison, uh, gradual ang pag-a-add. Usually, nahalis sa pagkain or sa gamot but in very minimum amount. Minimal amount lang. Hindi yung amount na madetetect agad ng katawan natin and then agad-agad uh, mailalabas siya. Okay. That is called cumulative type of poisoning. So we have the specific or systematic specific target siya. Ang general kahit saan ma-attach yung poison. And then cumulative, uh, it increases its uh, potency or intensity upon gradual addition. So now we will proceed to poisoning and the types of poisoning. We have acute poisoning, one in which there is a prompt and marked disturbance of function or death within a shorter period. So, ito yung parang agad-agad yung um, result. The following are instances of an acute poisoning. For example, these are the instances taking a strong poison, excessive single dose, several doses and small dose but frequently taken. So, katulad nga nung uh, arsenic, I mean, small doses pero frequent siya. That's an example of acute poisoning. So, another type is yung strong poison agad, magtitake ka ng strong poison, and then excessive single dose, 
and or several doses. Then we have chron that chronic type of poisoning. There is a gradual deterioration of functions of tissues and may or may not result in death. So, gradual yung deterioration or unti-unting nasisira yung mga functions ng tissues natin. This may be produced by taking several small doses at long intervals and taking only toxic doses of the drug. So, parang ang purpose talaga is sirain yung tissue, hindi pagalingin. Okay. So, that's chronic. Yung acute, parang biglaan siya, while chronic is um, gradual. So, we have the four elements of poisoning. The poison itself, the poisoned organism, the injury to the cells, and the symptoms and the signs of death. So, ito yung mga elements na dapat uh, hanapin in a poisoning incident. So, usually, ang nakikita kasi natin dyan, yung symptoms muna. Yan ang very visible. Siyempre, hindi naman natin alam, for example, pinoison yung isang tao. So, yan yung very visible, yung symptoms. And lalo na kapag in cases na nanamatay, una-una yung death, and then marirealize ng investigator ano ba yung naging symptoms, and then upon autopsy, malalaman ko ano yung injury to the cells. Siyempre, dito yan lahat nangyayari sa organism. And then, sa kapal lang madedetermine yung poison. Katulad ng napag-aralan natin sa basic concepts of forensic chemistry, sa forensic toxicology, kakaiba siya sa forensic chemistry. Dahil yung toxicologist, hindi lang siya nag-examine uh, ng specimen on, an, on a received basis. Kung ano lang na-receive niya, diretso examination na. In this, um, sa toxicology kasi, Kapag may nareceive ka na sample, wala kang idea kung ano ba talaga. Usually kasi yung sample niyan, mga stomach contents or kung ano yung na-recover sa katawan ng cadaver. So, wala kang idea ano ba yung pwedeng poison na nangyari or na-encounter ng victim na to. O ano ba yung poison na pwede kong ma-encounter sa specimen ko na yun. That's why, ang kaibahan ng toxicology sa chemistry, ay sa analytical chemistry or forensic chemistry na drugs lang i-examine, kailangan alam niya yung history, abstract, or medicinal background ng tao or victim na namatay para uh, magkaroon siya ng kahit konting idea kung paano niya i-extract yung stomach contents na yun. Siyempre, kailangan pa kasi ng extraction dyan. Okay? So, we have the conditions modifying the effects of poisons naman. So, those relating to the organism itself, uh, it depends relative yung poisoning or yung effect ng poison sa age, sa sex, and the physical state. Usually, sa age, yung mga middle-aged um, persons can tolerate the toxin or the poison more than the aged or the children. Although, there are some exceptions. Children are less susceptible. I, for example, these are the exceptions. Yung children, they are less susceptible to belladonna, strychnine, and calomel. Conversely, Yung mga children naman, kung less susceptible sila dun sa mga nabanggit natin, they are more susceptible naman to opium. So, mas nagkakaroon ng effect sa kanila yung poison na opium. Women are usually more susceptible, so are the weak or feeble. So, yung mga mahina rin, ang katulad din sa COVID na, 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 na experience natin, iba-iba, depende rin sa... Kaya inuuna yung mga senior citizens kasi mas susceptible sila doon. No, at first, yung mga kabataan or yung mga children, hindi pa sila gan ganong susceptible sa COVID. But then, dahil sa mutation, ah, nagkaroon na rin ng, na sila ng susceptibility. And then, kaya rin yung mga may high, mas high risk yung may mga pre-existing conditions medical conditions kasi mas 
uh, susceptible sila sa poisons or sa pagkakasakit. Then we have what is called idiosyncrasy. So this term applied when an individual exhibits peculiar unusual reactions on certain substances. This unusual sensi sensitivity or sensitiveness may be qualitative or quantitative. So many persons react severely with lobsters, shrimps, and with some drugs. So, katulad din to ng, hindi naman tayo, lahat ng tao may allergy sa lobsters or sa uh, mga hipon, pero meron iba na, meron silang nag, nagkaroon sila ng allergy. So, ang tawag doon is idiosyncrasy. So, next we have the habit. Yung repeated small doses of a poison generally lessen the effect kasi parang nagkakaroon na ng nasasanay na yung katawan. Habitual morphine users are pertinent examples. Very large doses being necessary to produce the desired effect. Parang sa mga pag-inom ng alcohol, kapag ka habit mo na yung pag-inom ng alcohol or Um, parang tumataas na yung toler level of tolerance mo sa alcohol. So, hindi ka basta-basta nalalasing, hindi ka tulad ng mga ibang kainuman mo. So, um, habit is an example. And then, next is yung tolerance. Ito yung sinasabi natin na some individuals exhibit a very noteworthy resistance to the action of certain poisons. So, this resistance or tolerance is natural not having been acquired by habituation. So, yun, kung yung tolerance nila, hindi dahil sa habit na, sa naging habit na nila yung pag-take ng repeated small doses, this is called natural. So, some persons may take large doses of morphine without any apparent effect. Katulad din sa, ano, example lang yan kung uh, sa vaccination. Uh, iba-iba din na reaction yung katawan ng iba-ibang tao sa pagka-vaccine sa kanila. Merong iba na vaccine na nilagnat ng sobra, sumakit ang katawan. Meron namang iba na ang sumakit lang is yung vaccination site. So, it depends on the tolerance of people with certain um, kung ano man yung laman ng vaccine. Okay, so next, yung disease naman, this may cause an increased or diminished susceptibility to drugs. Thus, renal diseases increase susceptibility to drugs. So, kapag ka may renal disease kasi, uh, usually yung mga drugs na iniinom natin or medicines, um, hindi naman lahat yan consume or na i-excrete natin outside our body. So, yung iba... Uh, nagkakaroon siya ng effect sa uh, excretory system natin, sa mga liver. Kaya nagkakaroon ng mga renal diseases. And then we have exhaustion. This tends to increase susceptibility. Siyempre kung sobrang exhausted yung isang organism, mas madali siyang kapitan ng poisons or ng mga sakit. Then sleep. This also tends to diminish or retard the action of poisons due to lessened functional activity. So, kapag tulog yung isang tao, so, syempre, parang naka-sleep um, mode din yung mga uh, organs natin. That's why, in a way, it diminishes or nalilesen din yung effects ng poison sa katawan. But, kapag nagising na yung tao at nag-function na normally yung mga systems niya, pwede na ulit mag-work yung um, function ng poison unless na eliminate na siya agad sa katawan. So we have the um, classifications though of those relating to the poisons to the poison itself naman. So kanina sa organism, ngayon naman dun sa sa poison. So yung physical state or form ng poison, uh, a poison is more rapidly absorbed in gaseous than in solid or liquid form. Bakit? Usually kasi yung gas, hindi nga nakikita kasi. So, unknowingly, kapag may poisonous gas sa paligid natin, hindi natin alam, hindi natin naiiwasan na ma-inhale natin. 
yung liquid form, um, uh, usually, kapag uh, alam natin na poison yun, syempre hindi natin iti-take or mag-take tayo ng precautionary uh, steps para hindi tayo ma ma-poison. Pero, for example, gumamit tayo ng mga muriatic acid, may mga leakage or spills na pwedeng maka sa katawan natin na hindi naman natin sinasadya. Yung solids naman, solid forms of poison, syempre, kitang-kita na natin siya, for example, in tablets, and then alam natin na poison yun, hindi na natin siya i-inumin or i-ingest. Also, the solvent containing the poison exerts a marked effect upon its action. Thus, of alcohol, alcoholic, watery, or oily solution, yung alcohol ang mas uh, na-absorb kaagad dahil sa volatility ng alcohols. Next is the dilution. Dilution of a poison tends to favor rapid absorption and therefore intensifies the toxic effect. Uh, since nadidilute siya or nadidissolve siya, mas... Um, mas mabilis yung nagiging, for example, dinisol, uh, soluble, kung soluble sa water yung poison natin at dinisolve siya sa water and then binigay sa organism, uh, mas mabilis yung absorption niya kasi uh, water is known as the universal solvent. Although may mga other substances na hindi soluble sa water. So an exception to this is seen in corrosive poisons which becomes less detrimental when diluted. Like um, yung acids natin. Yung hydrochloric acid natin, kapag diluted siya at hindi concentrated, mas less yung um, effect sa katawan natin. So, kung uh, yung concentration ng hydrochloric acid natin ay less siya, hindi siya ganun diretsyo makakasunog ng balat natin. But, kapag ka-concentrated siya, agad-agad makikita natin yung effect dun sa skin natin. Okay? So, yan yung effect ng dilution. Then, we have the solubility of drugs. For a substance to act as a poison, it must be capable of forming solution and readily absorbed by the blood. For example, the barium chloride, which is readily soluble, is extremely toxic while barium sulfate is not because it is insoluble insoluble so kapag ka mas soluble yung isang poison uh, mas poison na siya like uh, yung difference ng barium chloride sa barium sulfate since barium chloride is uh, soluble mas toxic siya pero since barium sulfate is not soluble hindi siya ganoon ka toxic then we have the mode of administration Usually, poisons are less rapidly absorbed when taken orally. So, mas matagal kapag ka oral ang pag-ingest. While intravenously, the intravenous route produces most rapid effects kasi sa veins na mismo siya or diretsyo na sa dugo. And then, yung dose, ito yung sinasabi natin na difference kanina. As a rule, the greater the size, the greater the effect. Yan yung general rule. But this is not always true. Like in arsenic, ito yung sinasabi ko kanina, arsenic in large doses irritates the stomach, cause, causing vomiting and prompt ejection of the poison. So that few or no symptoms result, kasi na-eject na, e na siya or um, na-i-vomit na natin siya, yung poison mismo palabas kasi na-irritate niya yung stomach in large doses. But in small doses, absorption occurs and terminates fatally. So, dahil very minimum lang yung dose siya, hindi na-irritate yung stomach, hindi siya na-ilalabas, that's why mas na-absorb siya. And kapag na-absorb yung arsenic sa katawan natin, it terminates fatally. Next is association with other poisons. This may increase the effect as morphine and, co and chloral together has a greater effect than alone. Sometimes, combining poisons decreases their effects. Morphine and atropine, aconite and digitalis possess antagonistic effect. Ito namang antagonistic effect. Ibig sabihin, naglalaban yung dalawang poison. So, um, nalilesen or nade-decrease yung effects nila dahil 
siguro nilalabanan nung isa na isang poison, isang poison kaya hindi nagkakaroon ng detrimental effect sa katawan. Pero meron din naman kapag pinagsama yung poisons, pwede namang mas lumakas siya. So it depends kung antagonistic siya or I think the other term is symbiotic. Okay, let let me check doon. So yes, it's symbiotic or the mutual effect. Nagkakaroon siya ng mutual effect. Then we have the condition of the surface where it is applied. Where the blood supply is greater, absorption is more rapid. Thus, it is more rapid in muscles than in the skin. Food in the stomach may delay absorption for it hinders absorption or reacts with the poison. So it depends also kung meron kang food sa stomach. So pwedeng uh, mahinder yung effect ng poison. But it is not always the case. It could happen but it's not always the case. So, the effects of poisons in the body, we have the local effects. These changes or, dis or disturbances produced on that part with which it comes in contact with. So, for example, the corrosion produced by hydrochloric acid. Then, we have the ro remote effect. So, ito local effect, uh, direct siya ang effect niya. Then, we have the remote effects. The changes or disturbances produced in distant parts away from the site of application. For example, the dilation of pupils. Ito yung sinasabi ko sa belladonna. If belladonna is taken orally, ang effect niya hindi naman makikita sa digestive system. But rather, it will be seen through the dilation of the pupils. While in local effect, since yung hydrochloric acid sa skin siya na exposed ang skin natin, makikita na atin agad doon din yung effect niya. So, yun yung local, ito yung remote. And then, we have the combined effects. Uh, for example, the phenol causes corrosion of the gastrointestinal tract that is local. And it also causes convulsions which is action on the cord or the spinal cord. So, meron siyang combined effect. Uh, both remote and local. Then, we have the entrance and elimination of poisons. Of course, poison may enter to the body through oral ingestion, through the mouth, intramuscular or intravenous injection, sa skin naman, inhalation, and pwede rin sa eyes. Kasi, di ba, usually pagka meron toxic uh, fumes, nai-irritate din yung eyes natin. And through rectum and vagina, it can be hypodermically or intra intravenously. Okay, next, uh, poisons may be eliminated naman. So, these are the um, routes or points of entry sa katawan ng tao ng poison. Then, yung elimination naman is through emesis, respiration, the feces, urine, milk, yun dun sa mga milking mothers, sweat, saliva, and even tears. So, di ba pag na-irritate yung eyes natin, usually, syempre, naiiyak tayo. That is uh, um, the function of our body para i-eliminate yung poison through our eyes. Okay? So, sa lacrimal glands natin, through our tears. The next posology. This is the science of the dosage. This, is, this deals with the study of the dosage of medicine to be administered within a certain period of time. The medical or pharmacological study of the dosages of medicines and drugs. So, ang tawag doon ay posology. Then, medicine, any substance administered to correct or alleviate the disease or disordered state of the system. So, yun yung usually tinitake natin pag masakit ang ulo, masakit ang katawan. And then the dose is the quantity of the medicine to be administered at one time. So usually ito yung mga sinasabi sa atin ng mga doktor natin. So take uh, three tablets uh, three times a day or one tablet per day, every seven hours, every four hours, it depends. So the dose concept is important because according to it, even, let's, uh, 
I want to stress this out. Even water is poisonous if too much is ingested. So, pwede rin maging poisonous yung water kapag sobra-sobra yung pagka-intake natin. Whether a drug acts as a therapy or poison, it it will depend on the dose. At kung tama yung pagsunod natin sa dosage na sinabi sa atin ng doktor natin. So, it's very uh, imperative or and very important for us to listen to the doctors kung ano man yung sinabi sa atin na dosages, kung kailan natin sila dapat inumin, dapat sundin natin yung properly. Especially, for example, sa antibiotics. Nagiging, meron kasing iba usually, nagiging practice na na kapag nagtitake ng antibiotics, may sakit, masakit ang lalamunan, sore throat, uh, may trangkaso, pinagtake ng antibiotics ng doktor. Uh, ito, mag-take ka two times a day for seven days. So, usually, 12, uh, every 12 hours yun. Kapag gumaling na sila dahil sa effect din ng antibiotics, kapag gumaling na, usually, hinihinto na yung antibiotics. But that is a big no-no. Dapat, kung 7 days sa atin pinapainom yung antibiotics, sundin natin up to 7 days. Kasi dyan nagsisimula yung... Um, Diyan na nagsisimula yung resistance or antibiotic resistance ng katawan natin. Kapag naging resistant na yung mga bacteria sa katawan natin sa certain antibiotic, for example, uh, mahinang antibiotic lang muna yung binigay sa atin, tapos hininto natin, naging resistant na yung bacteria. Yung bacteria, for example, ng, na nagkakos ng sore throat, naging... Um, resistant na siya dun sa antibiotic na unang binigay sa atin. So, hindi na mag-e-effect yung antibiotic na yun sa atin. Kailangan maghanap ng mas mataas na action na antibiotic ang ibibigay sa atin. Tapos, inulit na naman natin, hindi na naman natin tinuloy kasi hindi natin alam yung ano ba yung kahalagahan na ituloy-tuloy yung antibiotics. So, magiging resistant na yung katawan natin mag-develop siya ng antibiotic resistance Hanggang sa hindi na maging effective sa atin kahit ano pang antibiotic. So, mahihirapan na tayo na pagiling, pagalingin yung sakit natin. Kaya, ang advice ko sa inyo, kapag pina, may nireseta sa inyong antibiotic, sundin nyo kung ilang araw dapat inumin, ano yung tamang dosage, kung anong oras dapat inumin. We have to be very careful kasi pwede rin makasama sa health natin yun. Okay? Please, uh, please remember that always. Next, we have the types of dose. Meron tayong tinatawag na safe dose. This is one that do not cause harmful effects. Sometimes, however, it may be too small to produce the, the desired effect. So, hindi naman siya nagkakaroon ng effect sa katawan natin pag sobrang liit naman. Safe dose lang ginamit natin. Then, we have the minimum dose. This is the smallest amount of medicine that can produce the desired the desired and therapeutic effect without causing harm. So, that is minimum dose. So, ang kaibahan ng safe dose sa minimum dose, ang safe dose, hindi nga siya nagpo-cause ng harmful effects. Kaya lang, ang point doon is, merong mga instances na dahil sobrang liit ng dosage niya, hindi na napoproduce yung desired effects. While in minimum dose naman, uh, this is the smallest amount of medicine na nagpo-produce naman ng desired therapeutic effect without causing harm. So, mas okay yung minimum dose kaysa safe dose. Then, sa maximum dose naman, this is the largest amount that will cause no injury. So, wala pa injury dito sa maximum dose. But at the same time, can produce the desired therapeutic effects. Then, Ito na yung maximum kasi, di ba? Yung susunod na sa maximum is the toxic or poisonous dose. This is harmful both to the healthy and the sick. So, kahit na pinainom siya ng gamot na yun, dahil may sakit siya, kapag naging toxic or poisonous naman yung dose, harmful din sa kanya. Lalo naman dun sa healthy individual, na hindi naman niya kailangang uminom nun, pinainom nun, tapos on a poisonous dose pa. And then, finally, we have the lethal or fatal dose. This is the dose that kills. 
So, one dose, pwedeng, uh, pwedeng one dose, and then patay agad, or pwedeng gradual dosage like the arsenic. Ah, for example, um, merong mga napapabalita ang kasaba poisoning, uh, alam ba yun? So, nagkaroon ng um, news about uh, kasaba poisoning, I think it was in 2005, kung saan um, 27 children yung namatay after eating kasaba dun sa school nila. So, yung iba, ang classmates nila, nagkaroon, nagkasakit din, naka-experience ng diarrhea, vomiting. Kasi itong uh, kasaba, although gusto-gusto natin kumakain ng kasaba cake, uh, ano po ba yung made of kasaba, parang ganyan. Uh, but, uh, hindi kasi basta-basta din yung preparation yan. Katulad yung na-mention natin kanina na puffer fish. So, merong Merong way ng pagtanggal to remove the poison from the cassava flour. So, ito yung mga steps na alam naman yan ang nagpa-prepare ng uh, mga cassava natin. So, kapag hindi tama yung preparation, nagkakaroon ng bitterness, uh, bitter tasting. Kaya yung ibang uh, classmates ng mga children na to, na victims, hindi na nila kinain yung cassava cake nila. Or cassava nila. Dahil... Um, parang nung in-interview sila, ang sinabi nila, mapait yung kinakain nila, kaya hindi na nila tinuloy. So, yun din yung nagpo-produce siguro ng poison dun sa kasaba. So, kung hindi tama yung preparation, pwede mag ng poisoning. And then, uh, like this, kasaba is an edible tuberous uh, and not of the um, roots which are often made into flour. So, pero, pwede siyang mag ng fatal cyanide poisoning kung hindi tama yung pagkakalinis uh, sa kanya. So, ito yung sinasabi ko na dapat aware din tayo dun sa mga poison sa nasa kapaligiran natin na akala natin is safe siya, nakainin agad-agad, pero hindi pala. Then, we proceed to antidotes. These are any agent that neutralizes a poison or, or otherwise counteracts or opposites its effect. So, yung mga antidotes na yan, pwedeng mag-remove ng poison from the body. Remove, ang tawag doon ay emetics. It can also mechanically prevent naman, mechanically prevent the absorption or demulcent. Ang tawag sa kanila ay cathartic. And it may also change the physical state or chemical composition of the poison. For example, for sodium sulfate, uh, pwede niyang baguhin yung chemical state ng barium. Magiging, uh, yung mas um, less toxic is magiging barium sulfate siya. Okay? Uh, upon chemical reaction. And then it may act upon the functions of the body so as to overcome the effects of its absorption. For example, nakaka-experience ng fatigue or ano, ano ba yung dapat gawin kapag sobrang fatigue or may allergic reactions, paiinumin ng antihistamine. It depends kung ano yung reaction ng katawan. Ano ba yung dapat na i-counteract, parang gayon, ma-overcome yung effect ng absorption. So, we have uh, certain kinds of antidotes, the chemical, true or specific. Th this antidotes is one that makes the poison harmless and by chemically altering it. Katulad ng nabanggit ko kanina, kapag nagdagda, kung for example, naka-ingest ng um, barium na, na poison, kapag nagdagdag ng sodium sulfate, ma-alter yung um, barium into barium sulfate, which is um, non-poisonous na. Then, we have the mechanical antidote or antidotal measures, an agent that removes the poison without changing it, or so coats the surface of the organ that absorption is prevented. Ito naman na pe-prevent yung absorption. For example nga, yung emetics, cathartics, demulcents, precipitants, ligatures, washes, injections, and poultices. Then we have the physiological antidote or antagonist or symptomatic antidote. 
So, yung antagonist naman, these are agents that acts upon the system so as to counteract the effect of the poison. For example, chloral or first strike mean convulsion. So, ito pala yung ginagamit na antidote sa strike mean. So, kinakounteract niya lang yung effect ng poison. Actually, na-mention kasi kanina, no, walang, ah, saan ba yung walang antidote? Ah, sa ano pala yung walang antidote? Sa uh, tetrodoxin. So, let's uh, focus on emetics. Emetics are agents that causes vomiting. Kailangan mag-vomit para ma-expel uh, yung poison sa katawan. Lalo na kung na-ingest siya orally. Usually, ito kapag na-ingest lang orally yung poison. So, kailangan ng emetics to induce vomiting. So, we have local emetics. These are agents that produces their effects by in irritating the terminal nerve filaments at the parts they come in contact with. So, these are examples. Alum, or yung tawas. Then, salt. Pwede rin tickling the throat with the finger kasi di ba para ma ma masuka. Tap water, copper sulfate, mustard, zinc sulfate, ammonium carbonate. These are examples of local emetics. Next, we have systematic emetics. Systemic, I mean systemic emetics. We have tartar emetic. Wine of antimony. Syrup of ipekak, powdered ipekak, wine of ipekak, and syrup of squill. These are examples of systemic emetics. It depends kung saan part ng um, organism napunta yung poison. Kasi systemic siya. Ibig sabihin, nag may tinatarget siya na portion or na organ. Hmm. Then we move to cathartics. These are agents that produces intense intestinal evacuation. Then, so this uh, the use of cathartics is to remove the compound that formed by the action of the chemical antidote. This also hastens or pinapabilis na yung elimination ng poison. The demulcent is an agent that forms a protective film suits and protects the parts that they are applied to. Yung precipitants naman, these are substances that prevent the absorption of poisons by precipitating them and rendering them insoluble. So, pinaprecipitate na siya para hindi na siya maging soluble or hindi na siya maabsorb ng katawan. <clears throat> So, these are the causes of death in poisoning. Dahil sa poisoning, nagkakaroon ng cardiac failure. Then, often, uh, syempre, ang result is death. Respiratory failure, di na makahinga. General devitalizing. And shock to the nervous system. Parang nagkakaroon to ng stroke. Uh, so, that's the end of the presentation. I hope kung meron kayong mga clarifications or gustong itanong, just feel free to message me and to raise your questions during um, our Google meetings. Um, please study this, uh, study your uh, module also because all of these are included in the final examination. Thank you for listening.